to Lab 5. Lab 5, I think you're going to like. You're going to add action script and you're going to check when the uh, ship hits the walls of the maze. We're going to look at what a bounding box is. Okay, let's look at the bounding box of the ship. I'm going to click on my ship layer and then I'm going to come on down. You can see the bounding blocks box of the ship is this blue layer around the ship. Okay, let's look at the bounding layer of the goal. I'm going to click on the goal. So we're going to come up here and you see that blue layer of the around the goal. However, there's an issue that occurs when I look at the bounding box of the maze. If I click on the maze, the whole see that big blue bounding box. Now, how am I going to determine what uh, the the little things within that maze? So you can see the problem. If you put the if you have that um, ship hit the maze, it'll crash the first time you begin the game because you haven't uh, defined anything specific about that maze. It's that big blue box. So that's where shape flags begin. So a shape flag is just the visible part of the symbol. So the shape flag for the maze is the part of the maze where the rocks and the islands are visible. So we're going to use the maze shape flag in our hit test instead of the bounding box. So it'll be able to move through the paths and only crash when it hits the visible rocks. So now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name the maze. So I'm going to click in my first layer here. That's the maze. Click on that layer. Now I'm going to click on the visible part of the maze. And I'm going to name this instance name Maze. And make sure you're not clicking in a blank area. Now the thing is that when you go and hit the goal, right, you don't have to worry about the XY coordinates of the goal. You know, you just have to have the intersection of the two bounding layers of the symbol. But it's different if you're using a shape flag. Shape flag, you have to have the XY coordinates uh, to, in order to register a hit. So the way we register where the XY coordinate is is by that, that simple registration point, the XY coordinates of the box right here, right? And then of course we have to recognize the bounding limits, the extremes of the X and Y, but we're going to handle that later. But right now we're only going to deal with the registration point that little circle with the cross in it. So in this instance, this is how we, we code a hit test. What we're asking the hit test to say is if um, we're, we have the, ship, the shape flag here, the Boolean test, true or false. You know, as long as it's false, the ship's going to be okay. But does the ship's X or the ship's Y coordinate be the same as the shape flag coordinate. That's what you're checking for here with the shape hit test. So all we're testing right now is the main coordinates for the ship. The center of that ship symbol, the registration point. So we're going we're gonna to have this function. What do we want to happen when it, we have a true with a hit? We want the ship we don't want the player to um, keep it, be able to keep on dragging the ship, right? Then we want to go play that sync animation. So that's what we're going to do. So now I'm going to lock all my layers. And I open up my, act, my code layer and I click on frame 2. I'm going to open up my um, action frame here. So now I go into my copy code. And I go to my lab 5. And I grab from uh, line 35 to line 39. Right click copy. Bring this back up here. Go down to the bottom. 
go after the first of my three closing curly braces, click enter. I'm going to paste it in here. And now I check my, um, I click my check syntax. And I should click back and I should have three closing brackets at the end. You know, if it didn't work, go back and uh, make sure you got all the everything, okay, that you're supposed to. So now I'm going to run the code. Click start. Run my ship into the rocks. Did it ship sink? Yes. If it didn't, make sure you you put the code in right, and make sure that um, you named your maze instance maze. Remember, you have to click actually on a physical part of the uh, maze to make the name stick. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make the ship go um, back to the beginning, right back here when it after it sinks. So I'm going to minimize this. I lock my code layer and lock, unlock my ship layer. I'm going to do it directly on the ship. I'm going to go in frame two. I come down on the ship, double click my ship. I'm going to be in the ship child line. So I go here on frame 33. I insert a blank keyframe. Now I'm going to come over here in my copy code. And I'm going to go from uh, line 43 to line 45. And I go back into my um, action frame and I'm going to paste my code in here. Okay. Check it. Bring it back. Now I'm going to do my control enter. I'm going to run my ship into the rocks. Make sure it pops back here. Now remember, where am I? I'm in the ship child line. I'm not in the code line of my main thing. Okay. So I'm going to come back out. Okay, one of the limitations of uh, using Flash is that you can only use one shape flag. So you have to use, uh, if you want the boundaries of the ship. Right now, the only thing that makes it crash is this middle coming in contact with the maze. You want to make the external. So you're going to find different points, four different points of the ship uh, to hit to make a hit test. One each edge of the ship, so you only have to write four hit tests. The hit tests just check for when any of these points hit the shape flag of the maze. So let's think under the hood here a minute. Uh, on the screen, stage screen, you have your beginning point here is zero, zero. Your Y axis goes down, and your X axis goes across, okay? So you think of the maze as it being a point on that grid and you think of your ship as having certain x and y coordinates as an extreme right an extreme left an extreme top and an extreme bottom so let's let's imagine this is the ship here so as i increase the x coordinate of my ship the number gets bigger it goes to the right as my X gets smaller, it goes to the left. As my Y gets bigger, it goes down. As my Y gets smaller, that dot goes up. So to code this, all we have to figure out is the Y minimum value at the top, the Y maximum value on the bottom, the X minimum value on the on the left and the X maximum value on the right and that'll give us basically the bounding box of the ship. So now we're going to modify that XY coordinate we originally built 
four times. Wanted to give us the X Max, the X Min, the Y Max, and the Y Min for the boundaries instead of having just for the center of the ship. This particular hit test tells the computer to get the extreme, um, the maximum X value on that ship. And this just says whatever the Y coordinate is. That, you know, it has no real meaning here. You just have to provide it. So now I lock my ship layer. Open up my code layer, go to frame 2, open up my actions panel, and now I replace this um, underscore x. What do I replace it with? I type in get bounds, capital B O U N D S, then I put underscore root. end of parentheses, dot x max. So I want the extreme boundary on the, on the um, maximum of the x. And this is what it looks like. I just uh, replaced the underscore x with this expression get bounds root x max okay I check my syntax if it clicks me back fine if it doesn't check my spelling make sure I didn't trip over that y and that uh, under that comma and erase the comma just make sure you did it exactly according to the instructions of course, you're going to try it out, right? You go to Control Enter. Make sure that you can sync the ship by running it into the right. So now, of course, I'm going to go into my action code and grab the other three tests. So we'll go to my copy code. I'm going to come on down. This is a long one now. I'm going to copy all the way from line 49 to 63. Okay, right click copy. Then I come back to my game. I'm going to maximize my action panel. Now I'm going to come after, I see my closing three curly braces. I come after the first one and I paste it in there. So now I uh, make sure I've got three curly braces at the end. If you don't, you did it wrong. Just undo it and do it again. All right. So now I check my syntax and I run my game. Start. Now just drag it to the left, drag it down, drag it up, you know, try and crash it any particular way you can. Okay, now if one of your edges didn't work correctly, make sure that your code matches the example code exactly. Okay, check all your corners. Make sure sh your ship uh, sinks on all the sides. Then lock all your games layer and save your file. And you're ready for Lab 6. So what we're going to do in Lab 6 is we're going to add a timer to the game that counts down from 40 seconds. One way of adding challenge to a game is to add a time limit so that a t the player has to be careful but has to be fast. The three types of text you use in a game, we have static text, a lot of static text, instructions, a script that you don't expect to do anything when you click on it. You have dynamic text. This text will change. For example, we have a scorecard here, but there are other things you can do with text that change. Input text is something that the user puts in. So, for example, in this particular instance, the user enters their name. So now I'm going to make a new layer. I come over to the New Layer button here, and I'm going to call this layer Timer. Now I'm going to move this Timer layer under the Code layer. 
Now I'm going to click in frame 2 of my timer layer. I'm going to right click and I'm going to insert blank keyframe. So I'm going to come over here to my text layer, this T. Now what does it say in about when you have uh, C, uh, Adobe Flash CS5, 5.5 or 6, you got to do what? Let's look at it. Okay, I have the instructions open. What does it You come over here, Flash CS5, Flash CS5.5 uses read this first. What does it say about using text tool? Uh, follow this course step every time you make a new text box using the text tool. Okay, what do you do? Um, if you look at the anti-alias drop-down list and properties panels, make sure it's set to use device fonts. So every time you're doing a text box, what do you got to do? You got to set this tool to use device fonts. Since I'm going to be using a, a text box, I'm clicking the T, aren't I? I got to come on down and make sure it is an anti-alias. I you go click on use device fonts. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. You don't want the user to be able to change it, so you click selectable off. Alright, so I, I, is it static text or is it dynamic? It's going to be dynamic, so I'm going to change the static text to dynamic text. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to come on down. And I'm going to select for my font, I'm going to select Arial, or you can select what you'd like. And I'm going to make sure this is bold. And I want 30 font, 30, I want the font size to be 30. So then I'm going to put it in a color that stands out, so I'm going to choose red. Once again, make sure this is just uh, select uh, use device fonts and the user can't turn it off so you make sure that that isn't selected that one down there and you're going to name this instance um, name time text capital t time underscore text and you're just going to click enter now what am I going to write? I'm going to write zero zero then I'm going to make this smaller and fit it where I want it to go on the, the screen. Next what we're going to do is we're going to set the timer. We're going to set the timer to 40. We haven't set it to change yet, but when it starts it will start at 40. And that's going to be the player's time limit. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set our timer. So I open up my action screen. Oops. Guess I want to lock this layer. Go to my code layer and go on frame 2, go back into my code here, go all the way to the end. Woo! Up to the last curly brace. Now I'm going to go project copy code, and I'm going to come down, and I'm going to grab from line 67 to line 69 for setting the timer. I'll come back to my regular code, and I'm going to right click paste. Okay. So now I'm going to run my game and see if that happens. So there I've got my uh, starter starting at 40. It's not going to count down now because I haven't made it do that. Now, if that didn't work, make sure that you uh, remember to name your, uh, here on the timer level, you click time and um, click on that symbol. Make sure that you named it time text, exactly what it's supposed to be named, okay? And then your code should work. Now, when you're building games or other programs, you're always going to be um, writing unique functions. And um, once you write a function, you've got to call it you got to say when it happens and what happens when that function is called. So this is the format that takes. You say the function's name is whatever is something, right? 
then you say you say this is a function and then at whatever is in the curly brackets going to happen within that function all right so what we're going to do is we're going to um, call our function and the and the countdown so we're going to write a countdown function and we're going to call it somewhere in our code so here we're going to have a, a function we're going to call countdown and that means we start at 40 right and then we're going to, we're going to make it minus one how many times um, so we're going to just set it to minus one. I haven't given it a time increment here but we just said every time um, time sets down one we're going to reset the time this says to subtract one from time and then just reset the time to whatever that is. So this would run once, then the time would be 39. It would run a second time, the time would be 38. Run a third time, the time would be 37. See how that works? So I'm going to go grab me some more copy code. Come down here. Go from line 73 to line 77. Make sure you catch that last curly brace. Copy it. Come back to the um, copy code here and right after the last co uh, comment I mean last line I go paste it so now great we have our timer countdown but nothing happens what do you want to do when the timer reaches zero here we set if this says say if the timer reaches zero we're going to have this the ship play the sync animation and go and stop on the lose frame. We don't have a lose frame yet, but we will soon. <laughs> so now I'm going to go add that code. Minimize this. Go to my project copy code. And I come down to the next one. From line 81 to line 84, right click copy. Come back out to the Pirate Peril, open up my action frame, and right before that last curly brace, right after the word time text equals time, I click enter, and I paste my code. So I should have two curly brackets after, at the very end, okay? If you don't have that, go back and make sure you're pasting it in the right place. It should come right, that if statement should come right after the code you pasted last time. Now, um, nothing's going to happen yet if I run the program because um, I've written the code, I've written the function, but I haven't called it yet. But I'm still going to check my syntax. Everything checks out. If you didn't click you back, make sure that you um, copied it right, copied everything, and that you put it in the right place. You have two curly brackets at the end, okay? So now I'm going to call my function here. Uh, come down a couple and I'm going to write countdown now I check my syntax And now I run my program. Now see it went down to 39 and stopped there. That's because that's all we've asked it to do is count down once. Now if it didn't work, make sure that you typed it exactly right. You didn't misspell anything and you put it in the right place. Now we told it to run the function, but now we haven't given it an interval. Interval sets a length of time for it to count down. This says once per second. We're going to count it down. But it's still not looping it yet. We're telling it to count down every one thousandth of a millisecond, which is once a second. Now we're not going to need to this countdown function. We're going to call the countdown function inside the interval. So let me backspace over this. And let me minimize this, and we're going to go in the copy code, and we're going to copy our interval. So 
So I'm going to control V right here. So there, see, I told you, there's the countdown is set right here. Okay, another thing we need to do is we need to reset the interval. If a player wins or loses a game and wants to come back to frame two again, we want it to start over. So in order to get it to start over, we've got to clear what's in there. So we're going to set up a variable called clear interval. Clear interval equals interval. It's a function. So now you go into your copy code and you select from line 88 to um, 89, right click, copy, and then you come back into your um, game. And at your bottom of your screen here, you just um, paste. Okay, so you check it. If it clicks back, you're fine. So I put my uh, tape, um, I set my function right here, right above the set timer function. So now I test my game. So I watch it count it down to zero. Now you notice once it gets past zero, it keeps on going. Didn't move to a lose frame because we didn't create one yet. Okay, check your work. Make sure your project's on track. Make sure your timer counts down from 40 to zero. The ship sinks when the timer reaches zero. It's going to keep on going negative, but you know, you don't have a lose frame yet. Okay, so lock all your layers and save your game.